Welcome to the Shock Your Potential podcast with your host, Michael Sherlock. We all have potential, but sometimes we need inspiration to get us to our peak performance. Whether you are starting out in your career, ready to move up the corporate ladder, or taking the leap into entrepreneurship, Michael's guests provide powerful tools and resources to shock your potential. Shock Your Potential is a global professional development training company committed to your unique journey. Learn more about us today at shockyourpotential.com. Listen in to today's expert. Thank you for joining us on another episode of Shock Your Potential, where you know all month long, this month of February, the month of love, we are talking about leading with love and how it truly can be a competitive advantage when we embrace it. And my guest today is a good friend of mine as well. And I know that her mission, her vision, what she does with her clients is absolutely in line with this, especially when it comes to loving ourselves. So joining me today is Barbara Kaplan. She founded BSK Strategies, which is a business development consultancy in 2005. Her practice focuses on two distinct areas. The first is personal branding, working with women to help them stand tall with a new level of confidence, take pride in and credit for what they do, and know that it adds value and to help them realize the respect, reputation, recognition, and fulfillment they have earned and deserve for their distinctions and accomplishments. But she also does business development, working with individual lawyers, as well as small to mid-range firms in law practice to help grow and scale their practice, target win and win higher value work, establish thought leadership, which is so critical, and develop innovative approaches that distinguish them in a competitive and uncertain marketplace. And man, we've had the year for that. But I know we're definitely going to want to talk today with Barbara about a topic that is not only near and dear to her, but is really about, I think, our message and theme here, which is fire your inner critic and unleash the awesome you. So thank you for joining me today, my friend, Barbara. You're so welcome. And it is such a pleasure to be here. Thank you. You're welcome. You are doing so many things. And I know it's been so fun to watch the evolution of your business and see you embrace this whole other arena, dealing with women to help them unleash their inner awesomeness and fire that stupid inner critic. Um, But I know that's just a little bit of what you do. And so we had some highlights. So in your own words, tell us a little bit more about you, your business and how you help your clients to shock their potential. Okay. Well, some of this will be repetition. Um, I, my company is BSK Strategies, and it is a business development co- consulting practice. I help clients across industries and businesses earn new and higher value work, establish thought leadership, and promote competitive advantage. What distinguishes me and what I am told by my clients that distinguishes me is my passion for helping them do four distinct things. Establish a strong personal brand, which Michael mentioned, mm-hmm. or so they can stand tall, find their own voice, and garner the respect, acknowledgement, fulfillment, dollars, and recognition that they have worked so hard to achieve and deserve. And if you can stand tall with confidence and ask for what you deserve, not what you want, but what you deserve, you will get it. Mm, that's really true. What you deserve, not just what you want. And that's a really important distinction because I know that women in particular, not just women, but women in particular tend to struggle with this issue of really understanding what they are worth, which means what they deserve. So why, why is this such a passion project for you? You know, For a long time, I've said the marketplace tells you who you are. Mm -hmm. If you are showing up in a way that is reinforced by what the marketplace is asking of you, what services it's asking of you, that's terrific. If it's not, then of course you have to tweak so that you show up differently. But several years ago, as I started to really network in depth with some incredible women's organizations, I was approached by women who said, I really wanna work with you. And their situations were so similar. It was basically this, I work in a male dominated industry. For example, one was a trader and she was the only woman at the desk. She came to that company with her boss who basically said, I'll come if you take her. She'd been there for seven years, but on his coattails. 
if his phone were ever to ring and a headhunter were to call, there she is because she's mm. only known as his person. Mm -hmm. So what is it that distinguishes you? What is it that people can know they can come to you for and that's a promise you will keep every time? What is it that you can do for the company across the company that is better for the general, that you know, sort of feeds the general good? What are ways that given the things that impassion you, you can stand out? For example, their women's initiative or visiting other offices and, and teaching people at certain levels a new kind of skill. What are things that you can do that aren't already being done by somebody else that will get in front of management and establish your value in a material way because it will pay the company back? And typically mm. women volunteer for a position like mentoring or running a special event, which are not visible roles. Men do not. They volunteer for roles that give them a seat at the table. Or as we often say, they don't have to bring their own chair. So <laughs> the idea is that women are already distinguishing themselves and doing things that are different, doing things that really add value, doing things that other people aren't doing in whatever environment they're in, they're just not being recognized for it. And that's where the personal branding comes in. And a subset of personal branding is firing your inner critic because if there's a negative voice or a roadblock or an obstacle in your way and you can't move forward freely, you can't stand tall with confidence. And if you can remove that obstacle, which is often that negative self-talk, you're unstoppable. You know, I had somebody else this month that we were talking on a very similar line about the inner critic. And what she said just has stuck with me so much. She said, if you could ever tape what you say to yourself and play it out loud and you listen to it, you would be so shocked at how horrible the horrible things that we say to ourselves. And she was saying, you know, if you really would listen to it, you'd say, how could I tell those things to myself? I would never say such horrible or hurtful things to anyone else. Yet oh, I wow. have it going on in my own head. And I, it is just like stuck with me because it's so true in those moments of doubt, those moments of, of uh, self-criticism the words, the phrases, the, the, the intensity, the intensity of the emotion is so powerful. Why would we do that to ourselves when we'd never do that to anyone else? Well, one of the things that I teach in this sort of vertical discipline is how to unravel your inner critic from you, because mm. you are not your inner critic. How do you get her out of the passenger seat, out of the driver's seat? I'm very sorry. How do you get her out of the driver's seat and into the passenger seat? And one of the ways you do that is to give your inner critic a name. Ooh. If you name her, you objectify her, and it's not so much in your DNA anymore. But to your point about the things people say, um, this is actually a flyer that I'm going to refer people to on the work I do with Inner Critic. I don't know if you can see these thought mm -hmm. bubbles on top, but let me read you a couple because they substantiate exactly what you just said, Michael. Negative self-talk. If someone tells you that what something you did is successful, you're often, you're apt to respond, oh, success is no big deal. Hmm. If you walk into a room full of very knowledgeable, smart people, you might say to yourself, I'm not worthy of being here. They just don't know it. I'm a fraud, but I'm not worthy mm -hmm. of being here. What if they find me out? Mm -hmm. One of the things that women often do, and men are starting to do more, this is pre-COVID, of course, is to spend a lot of money on their wardrobes, to often go in debt just so that for every situation in which they put themselves, they look like they were born to be there. Yeah. But underneath that all, that's really like, they'll know I'm a fake. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm now $20,000 in debt, so I can look like how I think they look. And a lesson I want everybody to take away is do not judge your insides by somebody else's outsides. <laughs> so do true. Do not judge your insides by somebody else's outsides. A couple others of these. Oh, I'm just lucky. And you attribute your success to luck, not to something that you did or they're on to me. And I can tell you that these are true because in another presentation I did, 
the group of women who were, you know, participants were asked to type into chat, what is the first thing that comes to their mind when they think of this negative self-talk inner critic kind of stuff? And these, these thought bubbles apply in particular to something called imposter syndrome, that mm -hmm. you are showing up as an imposter of yourself. And many of these come from those conversations in chat where even a woman lawyer said, I have to go to court this morning and I'm so scared the judge is going to know I really don't know, all, you know as much about this as he thinks I do. Mm. Wow. Or they're going to speak to me differently because I'm a woman and I'm not going to get any credit. Or all the mm -hmm. things that we just say to ourselves. And so the gist of it is if you can name her and get her out of the driver's seat and into the passenger seat and distance yourself from her, that's a huge first step. That's, it's funny because uh, as you were talking, a couple of things popped into my mind. Number one is a lot of times when I'm talking to myself, um, not in a bad way, but when I'm um, in this case, when I'm like, uh, okay, you know, when you realize something like, okay, why are you doing that? I call myself Sherlock, you know, which is my last name. But when I start going, okay, Sherlock, you know, do you really want to eat that piece of pie? Come on, Sherlock, you need to not stay up and watch this show. Go to bed so you can get a good night's sleep. When I call her Sherlock, when I call myself Sherlock, it's that it's that reminder of, come on, you know, it's like, you know what you need to be doing so doing it, to do it. But I love the idea of giving her a different name when she's trying to creep in and make me doubt myself. Um, I think that's really power. I'm not sure what I'm going to name her, but I think that's really powerful. <laughs> but I wrote this down. But I also was thinking as you were talking, how many times I've really been working on this specifically because many times somebody will say, I love your hair. Now, not everybody loves my hair there. I get the funniest looks from people we sometimes. Love your hair. Thank you. I love my hair, <laughs> but, but I used to get when people would say, I love your hair. I'd say, Oh, thank you. I know. And I need to get it touched up or whatever. I'm like <gasps> why? They just told no, me I no, they no, love no, it. No, no, no. No. I know. And so I've really been working on this lately and probably for the last three or four weeks, every time somebody compliments me, I'm like, Oh, thank you. You know, and I play with it and smile and I go, Oh, and I just take the compliment. Just take the compliment. Don't put a butt after it. <laughs> well, you know, a lot of us, right. Cause butt negates it, you yes. know, and a lot of us, I mean, I'm a bit older and I grew up in a generation where women were really not supposed to, you know, show their stuff and stand out. And they were always supposed to be quite differential, deferential. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, quite mm -hmm. deferential. But, you know, it's, it's um, what I was realizing when I was talking about you know, when people are saying, Hey, I love your hair. And then I wouldn't, you know, I'd say, Oh, thank you. But what I was really saying to them is I don't believe you. I don't believe that you really like my hair because I'm trying to give you a reason to say it's not okay. Instead of just stopping and saying, I'm going to embrace this compliment somebody gave me and thank them. And by thanking them, I'm also saying, I believe you. Exactly. <laughs> thank you. I, what a gift you gave me. Um, and as, um, you know, I, as I have mentioned to you, I'm a bit older. So I grew up in a generation where women were very self-effacing. Mm -hmm. And often to your point about appearance, if I were with my mother and somebody said, you know, I love your dress or your outfit looks really, my mother would always come back with, oh, this whole thing. Yes. Oh, yes. Thing. Never yes. just a thank you, just take it in. And a lot of us were brought up feeling, knowing, intuiting anyway, that that's mm -hmm. how we were supposed to be. So it's a yes. real unlearning process sometimes, depending on which generation, you know, you were sort of programmed in. I, you're absolutely right. I could hear my mother saying that and I could hear myself saying that at other times. But I also, and, and this is just kind of a funny aside, there were many years that I sold Avon. And one of the things I loved about Avon is that they had clothes and jewelry. So costume jewelry and clothes that were very affordable and looked great. And I will never forget this time I had, uh, I had landed in Seattle and I'd gotten my rental car and I'm going through checking out at Avis, you know, so I'm going through the last thing where you hand them the, you know, your papers and your driver's license. And the gal said, and I was wearing this brown dress with this, uh, you know, fake uh, turquoise jewelry. And I loved, it. I still have them. I wear them all the time. And oh, the gal goes, yeah. she goes, you are, your outfit is beautiful. I wish one day I could afford turquoise jewelry like that. 
And I looked at her and I said, well, thank you very much. And guess what? You can. This is all from the <laughs> Avon catalog. And she goes, what? I go, I know the whole necklace jewelry thing. The whole outfit cost me maybe 50 bucks. She's like, I'm going to order some. And I remember, <laughs> I remember being really empowered by that too, because I wasn't, I was taking the compliment, but I was also engaging Helping her. Wasn't, right. Yeah. I wasn't even trying to sell to her. I just loved the fact that I could say to her, you can look exactly like this. <laughs> Don't be fooled. Not everybody's wearing real stuff. <laughs> right. <laughs> And you, but you weren't thinking, oh my goodness, she's going to think I'm a fraud or she's going to think I'm (laughs) a phony. You were not thinking those things is what I'm saying. Yeah, that's true. Credit. I am. Oh, I see. Yeah. I didn't want having this imposter syndrome language going around and around. Yeah. And you know, I didn't want her to, I didn't want um, to give off the wrong impression that I was wearing all real stuff. I didn't want to go, oh yes, I know it's so expensive. You know, it was really important to me that it was the reality of that. In fact, I have a couple of dresses that I have that are, that I got at um, flea markets and I love them because they're very retro. And so when everybody, you know, compliments me on them, which they always do, I'm like, I spent the 30 bucks on this. (laughs) Very proud of my fiscal responsibility. (laughs) (laughs) We should be proud. You know, Barbara, one of the things that I know we've talked about a lot is, you know, and you, you alluded to this earlier is when the universe tells you what you're known for and what you're doing, then it's your job to show up and then do that and live that authentically. And I know, um, as you really embraced, you love working with legal practices. I know you do, but it was interesting as you've shared your story with me over the last year or so about the moment where you realize everybody's coming to me and asking me, how do I stand out? How do I fire that inner critic? How do I, you know, get that seat at the table? You know, how do I embrace that? You know, when you finally said, okay, I can, I can have parallel tracks. I can have this one working with law firms that I, you know, have a great reputation with and love, but I can also do this. When you finally embraced the fact that you can operate this way, what did it mean for you and your self-confidence? What a fabulous question. I know. Oh, I'm it's so, a really I'm wonderful so deep. question. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, this is one of the things that I give COVID credit for. Mm-hmm. I think that COVID, as horrible as all this is, believe me, has given people permission to show their vulnerability and to admit their fears. And one of mm-hmm. the fears that's predominant across all populations right now is this terrible fear of uncertainty. I don't know what the future is going to look like. I don't know when it's going to be here. I don't know if I'm going to have control over anything. I don't, and just this morass of sort of amorphousness. Yeah. And this became the moment to do this. It just, everything aligned and it fell into place because as I, you know, sort of took, um, as you know, we, we share a membership at, at the Pyramid Club and the many groups that we are part of have now gone on to Zoom. And as these groups decided to meet more and more often, everybody's theme was, I'm so scared of the future. Things are so uncertain. Mm-hmm. And I started, people started to talk about, like, I can't invest in something that's going to take two years. I can't invest in something that's going to take six months. I just want to get rid of X, Y, and Z so I can move forward. And yes. as I did focus groups and talked to other women, clients, previous clients, colleagues, everybody said to me, the way I am buying services right now is in chunks, in spurts, in increments. I want to know that, you know, I have identified this as an issue. I want to know that in six or eight weeks, I can solve this issue and I can move forward. When another issue arises that's appropriate for that particular, you know, resource, I will come back. But knowing that people wanted to learn something and, you know, to have a defined outcome, a defined dollar amount, a defined vision of what something was going to look like at the end could bring them a certainty that took away the stress and gave them permission to move forward became like the thing of the moment. Mm -hmm. And that was really the light bulb to answer your question. This is the moment for this. And men too are coming forward now and saying, you know, this isn't a woman's issue anymore. Let me tell you how scared I am. What if I can't provide for my family? What if I lose my job? 
What if I, you know, my competition overtakes me because I didn't move fast enough? What if? And so this is the moment for this to, to, to give people some certainty. Yeah, I agree. I couldn't agree more. And Barbara, all month of uh, this theme, this is really something that I'm so passionate about. I think it actually falls, uh, you know, right in line, exactly what we were just talking about before the break with everybody in the world, finally feeling more comfort it's maybe not be easy, but more comfort in sharing their vulnerability, which I think is like an ultimate expression of love and trust. But my mission that I'm on, uh, you know, for this month, especially of February is to say, remind us all that when we lead with love, you know, we would lead in our interactions, we lead our teams, we lead ourselves, we lead our families with love, that we truly will get better outcomes in our life all the way around. And um, so I've been asking each of my guests this month about about, you know, what are your thoughts on this? You know, what, what are your, your takes on, you know, leading with love and really having us embrace this as, as individuals, as companies and as uh, economies, you know, global, global communities? It's such a perfect question for right now, because mm-hmm. if we don't lead with love of ourselves, we can't really impart love to others. And I know it sounds very (laughs) Oprah-esque, but it really is true that if we haven't fed ourselves, if we feel cheated out of something, if we feel ignored, if we feel undervalued, if we don't feel recognized for the things that we know are really special about us, because everybody mm-hmm. has things about themselves that are special and you know what they are. You're just, a, it's like Dorothy and her red shoes. Just click your heels, guys. Just click your <laughs> heels with those little red <laughs> shoes. You know how to get back to Kansas. You don't need anyone to show you. You know, I think you're, you're so right, Barbara. When we take care of ourselves first, <laughs> when we try and deal with ourselves from, from a point of love, you know, we really... We, we've got more, I don't want to say armor because armor means it's like we're protecting ourselves, but it's like, you've got, you know, more power, more, more energy behind you. Cause when you're taking care of yourself, you do have, um, more defenses against the negatives or the negative thoughts or, or negative possibilities. And, and I think that, you know, to your point, when we treat ourselves with kindness, we're probably going to be a little bit more likely to treat others with kindness as well. Well, something, uh, you know, that's unique about this time is that everybody's helping everybody else, like Mm -hmm. all ships rise. Yeah. So everybody's helping lift up everybody else. And if you do that for yourself, you're also doing it for others because you're more generous with them. You're more helpful to them. You don't bear resentment because they've, you know, sort of uh, their trajectory has surpassed yours. You just want all of us for the sort of greater good to be successful and realize what it is that fills us up. And it really is true. And so, I mean, I want COVID to be over just as much as everybody else does, but this is one precious thing that I think that we can take from this time that I hope all of us will carry forward and not forget. You know, the level of connectedness is so much deeper. The kinds of conversations are so different. The level of sort of bonding and reaching out to help I mean, the stories we hear on the news and the stories we read about the things that people are doing for others, even Mm. strangers. Yeah. You know, it's really a wonderful thing. And if we weren't all in this hardship together, we wouldn't be all reaching out to help each other. So if you love yourself first, and if you lead with that, and it doesn't mean you need to talk about it a lot. It doesn't mean you need to do anything specific. It means that you're going to show up differently. You're going to be different inside you're going to use different kind of language. You're going to speak to people differently. You're going to have a different kind of smile on your face. You're going to inspire them to smile and everything around you will just sort of exponentially be better. Yeah. And I think you're absolutely right. I hadn't really thought about that, you know, because we, in terms of us all trying to help each other more, and we all saw it, you know, when you think back a a year ago, um, you know, to when we first started hearing about this potential. And we were still going about our lives and our businesses as normal, which is why this whole, you know, when's it going to go back to normal to me is I don't think we want to, because normal at that time, you know, not for everybody, but for a lot of people, networking was networking, you know, networking is to get more business for me. It's, you know, it's, 
you know, it's, it's, I'm going to be business focused. I'm going to be whatever. Not that we weren't human to each other, but I think most people can really recognize that we made some really radical shifts because first, you know, when everybody was at home and nobody could see each other except for through the screen, you know, we were craving attention and we were asking things like, how are you doing? How are you holding up? You know, are you doing okay? Um, so we were asking better questions that weren't leading with business. But then what happened in a lot of cases is that our business discussions became much more, not just blended more personal and professional, but they really became questions. Like we slowed down long enough. You know, if your calendar wasn't completely packed, if you had a networking call, instead of jumping right in to let me tell you about my business, it was really about, well, tell me about your business. They were, we listen better. We ask better questions. And through this, I think that, you know, as we go out, I I don't know how many people on my um, show have said the same things that I have that, you know, yes, there's a lot of sucky parts to it. And I'm not discounting anybody that lost family or have had, you know, real bad um, repercussions from this. But for a lot of people, there's also this sense of, wow, I have gained might have lost a lot too, but I've gained things that I want to take forward. And so therefore there is no new normal, you know, it's, it's, well, I mean, I don't know, I don't know about normal or back to normal or new normal, but it's, Hey, I'm just going to continue operating in a way that I'm going to communicate with people. And that can only continue to raise us all up. You know, I heard myself say in a zoom call the other day that, you know, the last disruption was really, um, upsetting because it was such a paradigm shift. The disruption that gave birth to Airbnb and Lyft mm. and Uber. And I mean, all you needed was a laptop, a chai latte, and you were all <laughs> of a sudden a hotel that didn't have any beds and a transportation service that didn't have any cars yeah. and everything, the internet of things and everything migrated online. If we hadn't gone through that, we mm. wouldn't have been prepared for this. True. So this is in some way preparing us for the next thing. We don't know what that is, but I think if we can have some confidence that it is serving a purpose, um, that also takes a lot of the stress away. And now I want a chai tea latte. <laughs> I know, me too. <laughs> Barbara, I think it's fascinating. I love, I love your perspective and I absolutely agree. And I hadn't even really thought about that in terms of the disruptions, but it's, it, that really actually falls in, love, in, in line with my last month's theme in January, which was new year, flexible focus. Let's try and work on our brains to not be so completely disrupted when there are major disruptions, but be rather try and keep flexibility of thought and emotion so we can go through them maybe a little less traumatically. To offer up a little piece of advice because I received it from a dear friend and it helped enormously. One day as I was feeling what you just described in the sense of, oh, what am I going to do next? And am I going to be able to do it? And how do I make it happen? And I was kind of in a tizzy about all of this. And I called a very dear friend who um, actually does mindfulness for a living. And I said, can you talk to me a little bit? Because that's what extroverts do. They call a friend and say, will you talk mm -hmm. this through with me? Introverts do not. They go in the room and close the door and do it themselves. And um, she said, I'm going to send you something. I want you to read it. And it was um, a series of quotes from John Kabat-Zinn. And what it said was, when you're in this sort of mindset where you can't see clearly and everything is sort of moving too fast, sit back and just sit with it. Don't fight it. Don't try to problem solve it. Just lean into it and sit still. And I did that. Not easy for me to do. Mm -hmm. And I did that. And that's when all of this came into focus for me because I just let it bubble up and I was able to just sit with it. And I think that that speaks to what you were saying that, you know, we're so used to solving our problem and moving on to the next one. And that's what we want to do. But sometimes it's not a problem solving exercise. It's a just be still exercise. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I totally agree. Goodness, Barbara, we could talk for hours and hours always. And I think we have at times, um, but I know we'll have all of your contact information on our show notes, but just in case somebody wants to look you up right now, cause they're like, I need this woman. What's the best way for them to reach you? Please go to my website, 
bskstrategies.com, B-S-K-S-T-R-A-T-E-G-I-E-S.com. Excellent. Well, we will have all that uh, linked in as well. So um, before we go, do you have any last words of wisdom or pearls of advice for my listeners and viewers? I do. And here are three. One is whether you think you can or you think you can't, you are right. Mm. Whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you are right. The second is, as we've said before, give your inner critic a dame to distance her from you, get her out of the driver's seat into the passenger seat. And the third is, if you don't like the negative self-talk that you are hearing, you can change the channel. Ah, Excellent. Barbara, as always, you are very wise and motivate me as well. Thank you so much for being my guest today. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us on another episode of the Shock Your Potential podcast. Learn more about us today at shockyourpotential.com, including details on Michael's two best-selling books. Tell me more, how to ask the right questions and get the most out of your employees, and Sales Mixology, why the most potent sales and customer experiences follow a recipe for success. And as always, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and like us today.